Chapter 5 talks about the uh, geographies of race and ethnicity. It also calls it the mosaic or melting pot. So the book starts out trying to differentiate between the terms race and ethnic identity or ethnic group. And really it talks about um, the emerging idea that there really is not uh, human races, that we are all one uh, group with um, genetic commonalities and um, that this idea of, of race is pretty archaic um, and we'll, we'll look at this in a minute when we look at um, the Census Bureau and data collection related to race. At some point though uh, race was used to differentiate people often for profiling and so um, there were scientific uh, criteria set up based on the length of people's nose or the thicknesses of their lips or the size of their skull that would help identify people um, as, as racially different. And then um, in 2000, the uh, New York Times um, ran the story on you know looking at genetic differences and even though we do see some evidence of DNA um, origins uh, there really is is not a lot of difference in the human race. Um, so does race exist and it's really proven not to exist. We have slight variations but um, that's that's about the the depth of it. So um, what we're really doing when we talk about race is looking at physical features and physical characteristics. Um, and then the idea that race really, the concern is that racism is, is this belief that human, their ability and their behavior are determined by their physical attributes and that when we are um, acting on those beliefs then we, when the, then we are beginning to introduce prejudice uh, related to racism. So currently, or, or in the, um, the 2000 census, there were uh, criteria um, that made identifying people as racially different um, completely difficult because people were able to uh, list as many categories as they felt uh, were appropriate for them. So um, I, I just loved looking at this uh, at this question number eight is what is your first race white black uh, or Afri American Indian and then uh, looking at the second races. So we were still in 2000 using the term race and in the 2010 census that data was uh, not collected. So um, what they did in 2010 was allow people to talk about their eth ethnicity or their ancestry and you were able to identify as many categories as up to uh, six categories of racial or, or uh, ancestral mix. There's a nice little comparison of looking uh, comparison looking at the United States by pie chart, so the different uh, ancestral makeup or foreign-born uh, makeup of the U.S. and then um, a Cora Pleth map that's looking at um, the percentages of a state's total population of foreign-born. And one of the things I want you to do is just to really talk about what information you can get from the graph as opposed to looking at this spatial map, looking at uh, populations of states and their foreign-born. So ethnicity then um, begins to, to compare or categorize people by their language, their religion, their material and non-material culture, what kind of shared history, and their place of origin. So when we're looking at uh, ethnic groups of Afghanistan, um, so these are all Afghani people, but, but the ethnicity begins to bring in, or their ancestry begins to bring in subtle differentiations. The idea of ethnic groups then in the book talks about how um, by grouping people ethnically or by um, ancestral heritage, people begin to are able to maintain their cultural traditions, which could be their technologies, their way of life, their religion, and, um, and their language. 
So the book moves on then to talk about adaptations in a cultural context. So the idea of acculturation, and acculturation really means that people have uh, immigrated to a new place and adapted enough of the host country's um, cultural norms to get along. So you might learn enough language um, that you can uh, you can trade and you can go to the store, you could go to the doctor, you know how to work with money and take the bus, but you're not completely fluent and you're still holding on to your um, historical or your uh, country of origin traits. Over time, most Im immigrants, uh, first generation immigrants may have <clears throat> Um, acculturated, um, but by the time they're a third or fourth generation immigrant, they've completely assimilated. And what that means is they've adopted most of the cultural traditions of the host country. So our, here's the St. Patrick's Day Parade, and there are people who have ties to um, their historic culture, but they are definitely all American at that point. We've also, uh, in the U.S. and in other places, uh, experienced times of forced assimilation so that in, uh, in the U.S. the Native American, um, what they called the Native American problem, uh, where people were, t children were taken um, and put into facilities where they could uh, be taught the, the, the proper way to speak, to dress, and uh, in uh, Oregon, um, in Salem, at the Chimwa School, um, that's where, uh, where I think Chemeketa is today. That's where the Indian School was located at the time, and uh, the Native Americans in Oregon were uh, brought there as kids. So we can look at the physical characteristics of ethnicity um, in the ideas of ethnic homelands, ethnic islands ethnic neighborhoods, ghettos, and ethnoburbs. And here's an example of kind of an ethnic neighborhood in Portland, uh, Chinatown. And an ethnic homeland uh, are formal geographic regions, and they tend to have a strong connection for people uh, with family ties and family connections, a uh, very strong connection to the land, and this is an example of a Basque uh, home in, in uh, the Pyrenees, and, and it's a very strong, uh, often um, creates political bonds as well. So when you have an ethnic, ethnic homeland, um, there's usually a large population of people who have that same ethnicity or ancestry. There's some attempt for self-rule or autonomy, and there's this idea that there's a correct way of doing things, and you can see that in um, Native American populations or areas in the, in the U.S. They've been given some sort of autonomy. We also uh, kind of create this idea of what are the formal um, ethnic regions uh, in areas, and here is a map, a formal uh, map created using telephone directory and uh, last names. And so by using people's last names, um, the cartographers were able to identify what is the predominantly Mexican ethnicity in the U.S. What is the predominant Italian ethnicity in, U in the U.S. and where is the predominant Chinese ethnicity in the U.S. This method of looking at people's last names is still commonly used um, to identify areas. So here is a 1939 and 1970 study in Louisiana looking for um, people who had uh, French heritage and they used uh, the phone book again as a way to identify people uh, who had strong connections to uh, what was called the Acadian French and in 1970 uh, they looked at people um, who uh, who used uh, French as their primary language. Um, so the activity this week will be uh, looking at um, zip codes, uh, people's last name by zip code, and trying to understand if there's any uh, predominant ethnic diversity or makeup in Eugene. 
You can also have areas that are smaller than ethnic homelands that are called ethnic islands. And ethnic islands are small concentrations of ancestral or ethnic connections. And they tend to form these nice little um, uh, concentrations of people. And you might see um, if you were in, let's say, the Polish uh, ethnic island, uh, it, you might see uh, Polish bakeries and signs in Polish or, or crafts that were typically uh, Polish. Also, I'm a little bit looking or thinking about um, connections to folk culture. So urban ethnic groups have a, um, a function for immigration in that people who have the same ethnicity, if they're living in some kind of ethnic neighborhood, uh, would tend to have uh, a cohesive community. They would be able to use common language. Uh, they would have fo close family ties. And then there would be the evidence of special services, maybe shops that would sell um, f foods and clothing, medicine that would be common to an ethnic group. So this is, again, we're looking at an ethnic neighborhood, which is predominantly a voluntary community um, where people would choose to live or choose to immigrate to, or if they're in a country, choose to live in, the, in uh, California. There's a huge um, uh, Chinatown um, that is a voluntary community of people who've lived several generations in the United States. But by, by maintaining their uh, connections, they're able to have a stronger voice politically and also uh, maintain those cultural connections. Ethnoburbs tend to be the progressions from ethnic neighborhoods as people uh, want to move into the suburbs, uh, but, but they are still maintaining those ethnic connections and ethnic uh, associations where maybe people have more affluence. The, all, the book also walks you through this idea of ghettos um, and um, there's just a very interesting discussion of uh, the historic development of ghettos and that historically they were um, involuntary areas. So the classic example is the Warsaw Ghetto during uh, the Second World War where um, Jewish residents were forced uh, to live and to maintain. In fact, they were closed off locations. So today we have this idea of uh, ghettos as being uh, financially impoverished areas. And um, the traditional sense is involuntary residents, uh, people living in a ghetto are there because of involuntary residents and the result of conquest. So this is an example, uh, an image of New York City in 2004. And I just wonder about um, the idea of voluntary and as involuntary residents. So, I mean, actually we're not holding people at gunpoint to live in ghettos and, and so that would be considered voluntary residents. But I think people's uh, social and economic status, sometimes they really are involuntarily uh, living in, in substandard housing and, and uh, impoverished regions. So then we need to be thinking about why people migrate. And there's this kind of play between the push factors and the pull factors. And typically, um, the push factors are stronger when people uh, leave a place. Uh, the pull factors are kind of where indicate where people end up going, but it's the push, push factors that gets them to move. Um, and so, let me go back a minute, those push factors tend to be uh, economic. Um, if you can't make a living, if you can't feed your family in one area, you're going to uh, try to leave to another place. Often uh, push factors are safety, political freedom, and uh, the pull factors can be a variety of things. Um, Maybe they're just political, which countries allow immigration. Uh, maybe that's the chain migration idea that you have family members in a city in another country and they will take you in and help support you and get you moving. If you look at the uh, a, a map of international migration, you can see this this idea of in-migration and out-migration. So you can look at the pattern of where people are moving to and where people are moving from. And often in-migrations are 
countries that are considered MDCs or more developed countries and out migration are areas that are less developed countries. But it's interesting that um, we're beginning to see some patterns of out migrate or in migration to less developed countries and this happens when uh, wealthier retired people will sometimes move to less developed countries uh, so that they can have a higher standard of living and support um, as they retire. I mentioned chain migration. Um, this is a strong part of relocation diffusion and so you get that push of a neg negative condition in your home country or your ancestral land um, to a new place and so what with that chain migration um, you can have support people speak the language they can help get you jobs and often this would be uh, a requirement for being able to immigrate into a country it, uh, that you have some kind of connection. We can uh, this immigration uh, in the US has come from different parts of the world uh, so we can take a look at this uh, first wave of, of immigration prior to 1860. It was primarily voluntary immigration uh, from Europeans, but forced migration from West Africa in the terms of slavery. And so the thickness uh, of that uh, arrow kind of tends to show the amount of people and how they split up. And so you see a lot of uh, heavier number of African forced migrants into South America and um, into British uh, British Caribbean and the French Caribbean and fewer into uh, British North America. Um, around the same era you also see forced migration from uh, Native Americans from the Trail of Tears. Uh, over 15,000 people were, were what was called relocated uh, and uh, English convicts into Australia so there was a lot of forced movement from said developed countries or enlightened countries. The, in the United States the second wave of immigration came from uh, three primary areas the Irish and the German and then the Chinese or, uh, came in between 1820 uh, to 1890 and you begin to see a lot of political um, cartoons uh, really denigrating immigrants uh, you know, we, we still see that today as taking our jobs, um, being kind of sub substandard uh, citizens. And then the third wave of immigration in the U.S. Is, was uh, from 1890 to 1930, and these were primarily Southern Europeans, Greek and Italian, and Eastern Europeans. So we get to see these as political situations change around the world. Uh, the, the outflow of people is a result of that and the inflow into the United States. Um, now since World War II, we've kind of thought about this fourth wave of immigration. So m many more immigrants from uh, Latin America into the United States and from Asia, China, India, uh, Vietnam, South Asia. Uh, you get to see that. One of the things that I think is interesting is to look at immigration law over time and in the 1880s we had a uh, what was called the Chinese Exclusion Act um, and it was uh, an act that just targeted one nationality. Now remember the the Irish and the Germans were also immigrating at that time but we did not have an act that excluded uh, property ownership uh, um, uh, and uh, family uh, connections or being, bringing people over and so that was just of the Chinese. In uh, 1965 we had a country quotas uh, were eliminated and um, in the 80s we began to standardize some of our policies toward toward refugees and then in, in the 90s we had more of a, of a lottery trying to encourage diversity of immigration. Uh, we've had several times where we've had guest workers where there was temporary uh, migrants were allowed to work and there's been talk currently of uh, including some of those uh, types of laws that would encourage work but not citizenship and in fact um, Obama, uh, the Obama administration has just um, enacted laws that will help uh, children of immigrants who have come to the country that are undocumented but have uh, 
lived their entire lives in the U.S. Uh, and affording them the ability to finish school and, and some work uh, promotions. So there's a nice graph that shows kind of the the overall peak of immigration into the U.S. over time, the different phases. Um, and so we're probably really in phase six at this point. Um, and the numbers of people are shown in the uh, the depth of the graph so you can see um, this early uh, immigration from north and western Europe and um, the total integrate total in immigration the book then talks about some of the environmental uh, cultural um, components of uh, racism and I loved this map of environmental racism which means that um, people in uh, minority or uh, immigrant populations or uh, minority populations are often uh, located in uh, landscapes or physical areas that are less uh, desirable so this is a uh, each of these purple points on this map shows a toxic release facility, so an area, a factory that might um, release toxic materials. And uh, you can see that the percent of uh, minority population is pretty high around these places. In Eugene, there's a current uh, company called Beyond Toxics that is also looking at uh, the Bethel Danebo area and some of the factories um, that are. Uh, producing uh, toxics and releasing them um, atmospherically and how that area is uh, the largest concentration of uh, Latinos um, and Hispanics in the region and how there's a they have a very strong uh, belief that this is an example of environmental racism in the area um, let's see I wanted you to look at uh, this this map that shows um, ancestry. So how people identify who their ancestors were, and um, looking at the the difference um, in uh, spatial um, development or spatial uh, regions in the U.S. And I love um, this just very strong uh, Mexican ancestry along the border. I mean, this very clear and African American ancestry where uh, many of the early slave populations were first uh, brought into the U.S. Um, but I, what I want you to kind of struggle with is this white section here. And I, I wonder if it's any if it's a coincidence that they colored that area white, but that's that's called the American ancestry, and I don't think they mean Native American. So I really want you to kind of think about in one of the essay questions, what what would that look like if you if you somebody asked what your ancestry is if you said American, uh, or what are these people thinking as American ancestry and and kind of I just thought that was a very curious map. Um, oh shoot, I stepped on my own toes. Here's the Beyond Toxic uh, uh, map um, looking at the environmental uh, justice or the environmental racism in, in the United States or in the area. Uh, the book also talks about the difference between uh, involuntary migration um, and forced migration as, as a part of being a refugee and uh, uh, result of genocide and so that genocide is considered systematic killing of people and there's an amazing book written by a forensic scientist or forensic anthropologist called uh, the bone woman and she talks about going into uh, areas where there has been ethnic uh, cleansing or genocide of groups of people and how um, often uh, countries will say these these genocides just happen, that people just exploded in anger and what they found is that uh, there's been prior to the genocide preparation um, systematic uh, sing identifying of people, um, large equipment to, to uh, dig graves and, and quite quite a lot of preparation gone into that. Um, the uh, UN um, Council on Genocide has uh, identified kind of eight stages of genocide where people begin to classify so you're you're um, 
you're, you're identifying who belongs to certain groups and then uh, symbolization, dehumanization begins to happen, caricatures in the newspaper um, and then you know then the state begins to prepare so organi organizations begin to uh, offer um, pass passports that have special stamps or documentation that would identify people trying to know where they are and then um, you go through these other stages into extermination and then often people are in denial that that's that's what happened there's a nice website at www.genocidewatch.org um, that looks at several of the criteria where people are, or where countries are in those stages of genocide. Uh, Zimbabwe in uh, 2003 was identified as in stage 5 of genocide. So if I go back here, um, that's kind of the polarization of people and that extreme fundamentalist kind of idea. Um, Syria. This was this this vi or this PowerPoint was created in oh I think three years ago, and it was predicting at that point that Syria was uh, at this stage of uh, deteriorating humani humanitarian crisis, and we know where that is today, in 2012. So here is a 2012 map of countries at risk, um, and. Um, it's kind of another choropleth map identifying no risk, high risk, uh, moderate risk. And the UN Council on Refugees also identified several criteria. Uh, who gets to be a refugee and who is not. Um, so if there's persecution for race, religion, nationality, group membership, social or political. And I think at this point there is no uh, refugee status for uh, gender um, sexual orientation. You're a refugee if you're living outside the country of your nationality. So if you're in your country, uh, you are you cannot be a refugee. You have to be able to get out of your country in order to be a refugee and have protection. Um, if you're unable or unwilling uh, to to get protection of your own country, that's you're considered a refugee. And if you're afraid uh, to sue your country, if you don't have any litigation rights, or you're afraid uh, to return. If you're not a refugee, if you have uh, voluntarily asked for protection of your country, um, if you voluntarily uh, reacquire nationality, so if you go back to your home country, uh, if you've committed a crime, uh, you can't commit a war crime or a crime against humanity, then leave that country and claim that you're a refugee, that it's not safe for you to go back. Um, or if you have created or c committed another crime outside another country. And just to end up, uh, when you're comparing kind of uh, ethnic neighborhoods with uh, ghettos or looking at the difference between voluntary and involuntary migration um, and just to think about that most most refugees uh, move without any property uh, they're moving uh, taking only what they can carry with them they're often often going by foot by bike by wagon um, and they have no official documents so if you've ever seen uh, the video the lost boys of Sudan that's just a great video that talks about um, how these children um, left uh, their country um, when when war broke out and how they lived for years uh, without any official documents that talked about how old they were um, and so that when they came to the United States it was very difficult for them to uh, prove that they were able you know that they were it was appropriate that for them to be in a high school or college age so a uh, great chapter lots and lots of information and um, so I'll have some more information on the exam as that comes up thanks <laughs>